Mr. Chancellor, Chair of the Board of Governors, Madam President, graduates, honored guests. Great fictional detectives are often associated with very specific locations. One thinks of Sherlock Holmes, Hercule Poirot, Adam Dalglish with the City of London, Endeavour Morse with the University at Oxford, Miss Mary Marple with the village of St. Mary Mead, and as a medievalist, my favourite brother Cadfell with the medieval Abbey of Shrewsbury. But what Canadian readers, and perhaps more specifically Anglophone Quebec readers, lacked for so long was someone from Chez Nous, someone who inhabited the spaces that we recognized, who had friends who thought and spoke like we do, someone with whom we could identify and whose cultural references we could recognize. We lacked this until the appearance of Chief Inspector Armand Gamache, whom we first meet as head of homicide for the Sûreté du Québec, although in more recent novels he has retired to the tiny village of Three Pines in Quebec's eastern townships, the site of many of his earlier cases. Founded at the end of the 18th century by United Empire loyalists and situated a few kilometers from the Vermont border, Three Pines is a place where time seems to stand still, or perhaps to have been forgotten in another age when the CPR station still witnessed trains running up to Montreal. Not that Chief Inspector Gamache manages to stay out of the, de the detective business very long. Who knew that so many murders could take place in such a small village at In Arcadia Ego? Armand Gamache's creator, Louise Penny, was born in Toronto. And after graduating from Ryerson University, she worked for some two decades as a journalist for the CBC in Toronto, Thunder Bay, Winnipeg, Quebec City, and Montreal. And in the latter two cities, hosting the morning and noon hour radio shows, respectively, before she began to devote her time to the writing of murder mysteries. And thus far, there have been 12, all published by Minotaur Books, with a 13th due later this summer. And these have very quickly found their way to the very top of the New York Times bestseller list. They have also won her numerous writing awards, including five Agatha Awards for Best Mystery Novel of the Year, and also five Anthony Awards for Best Novel of the Year and her books have now appeared in more than 20 languages. It's easy to understand why. Surrounded by rolling hills and stands of maple, Three Pines is a village of white clapped, clapboard Victorian era houses with wide porches. It's the kind of place you come across by chance when you get lost. And after a bowl of cafe au lait at Olivier's Bistro, and perhaps a serving of baguette and local cheeses, and probably some conversation with an engaging cast of local residents, possibly Ruth, the poet, or Myrna, who owns the bookstore, or Gabri, or Clara, you discover that you never want to leave, and thus you don't. Three Pines is not only lost in time, it is also a place of sanctuary, both intellectual and emotional. And then, of course, there's Armand himself, instantly recognizable from the Half Moon reading glasses with his wife, Reine Marie, formerly a senior librarian at the Bibliothèque Nationale, and no doubt Henri, their German shepherd, is somewhere close at hand. The company is affable and literate, well-versed in literature, history, and art, and an understanding of those subjects seems always to feature in the solution of the baffling murders. Most importantly, however, the world of Three Pines is a place with which those of us who come from that particular part of the globe can readily identify. In fact, it is two worlds, a wonderful 
melange of French and English, incorporating the best of each culture. In her novels, Louise Penny captures the very essence of l'estrie. And her contribution to Canadian literary culture was recognized in February of this year by her appointment to the Order of Canada. And I'm sure I'm not the only one eagerly anticipating the release of the next novel, Glass Houses, on August 29th. Mr. Chancellor, in recognition of her career as an award-winning broadcaster and detective fiction author, I request that you confer the degree of Doctor of Literature Honoris Causa upon Louise Penny. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Governors and upon recommendation by the University Senate, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Literature Honoris Causa. Congratulations. Now I have a little song. No. <laughs> I want to thank the Mr. Chancellor, the Chair of the Board, Madam President, graduates, honored guests. This is an incredible experience to stand here and celebrate you and celebrate all that you have done and will do going forward. This is a moment of great hope, not only for you, but for Canada. It is a, a marvelous thing to be able to stand here and to be getting an honorary degree. Um, it is, it's significance, I have to say, for me, goes back to long before you were even born. As, as John said, I, my degree was from Ryerson, and I had the most wonderful time there. But the truth is, and I have never admitted this to anyone, so I know I can trust you, you will not let it go any further. <laughs> the university I actually wanted to go to was Carleton. It was my university of first choice. It was the place I dreamed of going since I was in grade nine. And the reason I didn't isn't because I was rejected. It was because I never even applied. And the reason I didn't apply is because I was afraid of being rejected. And thinking about that, thinking about coming here today, got me reflecting on the role that fear has played in my life, all of my life, since the time I was a child. Now, hearing that, you might sort of wonder, well, how did she get up there? I must say that's a very good question, one that my brothers, who are also here, are also asking, though theirs is really more like, how did she get up there? <laughs> when I was your age, no one would have seen that I would write a book, never mind a series of books, never mind get an honorary degree. It was absolutely inconceivable. I did not have success written all over this magnificent body. That was not meant to be funny. <laughs> Fear has ruled me all of my life. So how did it happen? Well, I'll tell you, and thankfully for you, it's riveting. I think of my, my favorite Far Side cartoon. There is a point to this. It shows two scientists, you might have seen it. They're standing in front of a blackboard, and on one side is the formula, then there is a blank spot, and then there's the solution. And the one scientist is pointing to the gap and saying to the other scientist, I think you have to be just a little more specific. Because in that gap, the first scientist has written, and then a miracle occurs. Between formula and solution, and then a miracle occurs. And that's how it feels to me. That's how I got here. Now, I know that that is not very helpful, so I will try to be a little more specific. As I said, I have been afraid, genuinely afraid, all of my life. For no particular reason, but it was there. I was afraid of shadows. I was afraid of bright sunshine. I was afraid of heights, of holes, of the morning dew. I was afraid of other children. 
The only place I really wanted to be was alone in my bedroom reading. That was the only place I felt safe and sovereign. In fact, it got so bad that my mother, as punishment when I was naughty, would send me outside to play. And as I got older, things did not get better. But I understood that going through life trembling was not the image you want to, to, to put forward. So I went out of my way to prove that I wasn't afraid. I went hang gliding, I went parachuting, I dated an engineer. <laughs> I, I was to all appearances fearless and, you know, maybe a little stupid. <laughs> but it was a facade. Inside, I was curled up, trembling. And, you know, that kind of fear is paralyzing. So that by the age of 35, I was a suicidal alcoholic, which is not as much fun as it sounds. I was working for the CBC, as John mentioned, become a journalist. Now that might explain, of course, some of the suicidal alcoholism. And I got to the stage, I was standing in my bedroom I couldn't move forward and I couldn't move backward. I was paralyzed. I, I, I was about to go into the great job I had, leave the beautiful home that I owned, and I wanted to die. And I, I looked at myself and I was, obviously, I was terrified. And then a miracle occurred. And when I tell you what it is, you will yawn. I'll yawn. I even bore myself with this. Which is, you know, it does, it's not a great selling point for the, at this very moment. But it is so banal as to be embarrassing. But I think many miracles are. I think many miracles are easily overlooked or mistaken for something else. What happened to me was that I asked for help. I mean, it sounds so simple and it sounds so obvious. But for the first time in my life, I dropped that veneer, that facade, and I let someone see what I was really like, how very afraid I was. For the first time in my life, I reached out like a drowning woman, and I've always been afraid, of course, afraid that if I reached out for help just before I went oh, under, not waving but drowning, that no one would care enough to reach back. But they did, and that was the miracle. And in that moment, I went from wanting to die, to wanting to live. Within a year, I had met the love of my life. Within five years, I was married and written the first book. And now 20 years later, I stand before you humbled and grateful and filled with joy. Shortly after getting sober, I listened to a man who who talked about the four statements that lead to wisdom, and they became the cardinal directions of my life, and still are. I'm sorry. I don't know. I was wrong. I need help. I ended up marrying that man, Michael Whitehead, and he became the inspiration for our manga mash. He was the, Michael was the head of hematology at the Montreal Children's Hospital. He was the doctor no one ever wanted to have to meet. He treated children with cancers and had to tell young parents things no young parent should ever have to hear. And he sat by those bedsides and held those little hands into the night and beyond. And yet he was the happiest man I ever knew because he understood what a gift life is. And what a betrayal it would be of those young lives if those of us who get to live it don't do it with joy, with gratitude, with kindness, and with courage. Michael developed dementia a few years ago and died this past September at home and at peace. And uh, at the end, I, I sat by his bed and I held his hand and I told him he was handsome and kindly and generous and brave and that he was safe and he was loved. 
Your lives are ahead of you and many, many wonderful things are going to happen to you. But if, perchance, you find yourself on the edge, believing that there is no way forward and that the best is behind, if you find yourself looking into that gap, I want you to know it is not true. Every day of my life, I am grateful for the wonderful things that happen. But I am also grateful that I got a chance to look into that gap. No gap, no miracle. No miracle, no Michael, no Michael, no books, no books, no. And that's how I got here. When I write, I have in front of me, on the wall, a poster with the last words of the great Irish poet Seamus Heaney. On his deathbed, he whispered to his wife, Noli, to marry, be not afraid. I want to thank you very much for allowing me to share your special day, and I want to thank you for sharing mine. Noli to marry, dear friends.